Hello, I'm Matt Kelly. And I'm Matt Dancona. And this is The Two Mats for the week ending Friday the 20th of October, a podcast that has not given up on hope despite it all. What did we talk about this episode, Matt? Well, obviously we had to talk about um, the ongoing um, crisis in the Middle East, um, which you know is is occupying all the oxygen really in in the media room at the moment and uh, we had a, a good discussion about the, all, all the, the shuttle diplomacy that's been going on i think uh, I, I mean i've listened to a lot of podcasts on this topic lately and i think that ours is slightly broader in terms about what the European Union yes. is doing, what Germany is doing, and we had our special guest Tannik Koch all the way from Frankfurt, which is uh, very underreported in, in in the UK. Yeah. What's going on in the EU, and it's important to what's going to happen in the Middle East, actually. And it I really think is. Tannit's insight, which, oh, very which interesting. you'll get, folks, in the second half of the podcast, is is fascinating, especially if you care about the bigger picture and not just the sort of day to day row that we see in the in the yes. media in the UK. Okay, so what are we going to call the episode? Well, we, we we gave Biden some you know serious praise. For yeah, his which coming from you was uh, I know I, I I've you're been not a big I'm, Biden fan. Well, I I've been the first to say you know I'm the first to say that I'm I'm happy to eat my hat over this. Yeah, um, you know I'll I'll take that. Okay, so um, what real statesmanship looks like? What real statesmanship looks like? Okay, let's go with that. Okay, so this is the two mats episode eighteen. What real statesmanship looks like? Enjoy. Enjoy. So, Matt, what are we talking about this week? As if there's anything else to talk yeah, about. Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, there is only one subject to talk about, and it's it's a bleak one. I mean, I I feel now we're recording this on Thursday. This is day thirteen, and it's day thirteen of a crisis that I, I fear is going to go on for quite a long time. Um, there's no question there are terrible times ahead. Yeah. Um, it's interesting because today, Thursday, Rishi Sunak has been in uh tel aviv and he yeah. did a uh, an appearance of sorts with benjamin Netanyahu, the um, uh, israeli prime minister and i don't know what you think but i, I felt, i'll tell you what i think in a minute yeah, yeah but i was going to say is that you know to put it politely mm. uh it compared to some of the other people that have been through it, we can go on to talk about it looked pretty inconsequential weaselly i sort of thought it um, was it we, was like diplomatic tourism you know yeah, it was odd. I mean, as ever, and I don't want to get hung up on this because maybe it's just a, a, a language tick, but I would commend people to listen to how often he refers to himself, you know, in the first person. And he, he said, you know, I just thought it was important to be here to show uh, Israel that the United Kingdom and I stand fully beside you. Yes. you know, it's like, and I, what the hell, and I? I mean, yes, you represent the United Kingdom, mate. It's Rishi Sunak as a person is of no greater relevance than the United Kingdom. You're there to represent the UK. You and I, what I'm doing, what it, we, you know, it's it's all about him. You know, it seems so weird. I also felt that, um, you know, when you think of, even in recent history, Tony Blair or Gordon Brown or even David Cameron going to, theatres where there were serious there were serious conflicts it really mattered and there is this sense there's no question about it and i know it's the thing that we talk about most but it, there's a reason for it is that post-brexit united kingdom is just less of a power than it was yeah. and that was very visibly apparent you could I, see the netanyahu was going through the motions being polite well he'd done the big one hadn't he he'd well we, by, which is yeah. what we should i think focus and, on and, in this and i think if we compare just before we leave the yeah. subject of rishi sunak I was struck because Matt Fry from Channel 4 News pinned him down as he so often excellently does and asked him essentially, you know, will you be urging restraint on uh, on Israel? And Sunak couldn't, wouldn't answer the question. Just said, first of all, what I'd like to say is how, how, how important it is that I am here, you know, blah, 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 blah. And completely ignored the sentiment of the question, which is, are you actually going to do anything statesmanlike and say, Benjamin, please, you know, let's think this through before yeah. you raise Gaza to the ground. Richard Bacon tweeted, 
I've been really surprised by how much I've come to dislike Rishi Sunak. He's just a bland, cautious, wet nothing with no ideas. He can't even come up with a phrase that allows him to express a bit of concern for innocent kids in Gaza. And he's absolutely right. Well, it looked like Netanyahu was having a a slightly incomprehensible public meeting with his accountant. Yeah. You know, I couldn't make sense of it. On the other hand, and in big contrast, and, you know, I've been pretty critical of... Joe Biden. Yes, <laughs> on, you have. On, like on the last, on the last, well, not the last one, but the one before last, we discussed. You know, was he out of his? Depth? Was he out of his and, depth? And now, you, I, clearly... you know, and I'm happy to eat my words to this extent that I think whatever else happens now between uh, this week and the gen- and the presidential election in November 2024, what Joe Biden did in Tel Aviv on Wednesday was historic. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure it was actually people have quite grasped how historic it was. I think it will be remembered. I hope it will on a par with Kennedy in 63 uh, saying Ich bin ein Berliner in West yeah. Berlin or Reagan saying Mr. Gorbachev tear down that wall in um, 87. Now he doesn't have the sort of Biden doesn't have the kind of um, megawattage charisma of either of those two presidents. But if you go through what Biden did, it was unbelievably smart and helpful. So, number one, he he asserts American hard power. He puts two carrier groups into the region, uh, the Eisenhower and the Ford. And this is a message, especially to Iran and Hezbollah, saying, just don't even think about it. When you say it, carrier right? groups, you're talking about big aircraft, aircraft carrier groups. And all the associated ships. And all the associated ships. It's like ships. an armada, isn't it's it? It's like an armada. And yeah. they're sitting there and they're, you know, they are... There's a message to Iran and Hezbollah before anything else saying, don't even think about it, guys. And we've heard him say, don't, don't, don't. And he obviously mean that mean, you know, shows he means it. Before he left, he goes on 60 minutes and he s- a- agrees that Hamas has to be eliminated entirely, which is a big deal because that's the basic starting point of the Israeli strategy so yeah. he arrives with that already offered to netanyahu the fact that he goes there is a big deal no american president has ever been to israel in the middle of a war yeah no american president went before nixon in 1974 is I that discovered. right yeah it's amazing yeah. so you know and this is an 80 year old man yeah um so while antonio guterres the un secretary general is in beijing with excuse me vladimir putin and g lecturing Israel mm. at the Belt and Road conference, Biden is in Israel taking a big, big risk. He takes an even bigger one. He says he believes the Israeli account of what happened with the awful yeah, attack the on Tuesday night with the hospital. He said, you know, it was done by the other team. Now, yeah. clearly he has intelligence suggesting that, but that was a, a risk, and and, 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 uh, and w- it was a fortunate choice of words, wasn't it? Because the other team thing got got over. That became the story. It's that like, became the story. This isn't a game. But anyway, moving on from that, that was a big deal. To that state was a that. very yeah. big deal, and you could see Netanyahu registering as such. Yeah. Then he does what he does. What he does so well, which is show empathy. And I think if we could ask our producer, the third Matt, to give us Can a you clip. Play that clip. For those who are grieving, a child, a parent, a spouse, a sibling, a friend. I know you feel like there's that black hole in the middle of your chest. You feel like you're being sucked into it. The survivor's remorse, the anger, the questions of faith in your soul. Starting at staring at that empty chair, sitting Shiva. The first Sabbath without them. They're the everyday things, the small things that you miss the most. The scent when you open the closet door. The morning coffee you shared together. The bend of his smile, the perfect pitch of her laugh, the giggle of every little boy, the baby. For those who have lost loved ones, this is what I know. They'll never be truly gone. I mean, that's a really big thing yeah. because obviously anyone who knows Biden's history knows he lost his son, Bo Biden, yeah. in uh, 2015 and earlier in a horrific car crash in the 70s, lost a, a wife and a young daughter yeah so he knows about he knows that person and basis, he speaks yeah. with authenticity and power yeah. and he, but he's crucially he's doing it in tel aviv yeah. so that then enables him to 
you know, he's bought himself permission yeah. to do some quite big things. And he says in that speech, same speech, you know, don't do what America did after exactly. 9-11. Yeah. You know, I caution this while you feel that rage, don't be consumed by it. After 9-11, we were enraged in the United States. While we sought justice and got justice, we also made mistakes. Again, a big a, a thing. Huge, huge thing to say. And, and, and Very and just consequential. From, from a rhetorical point of view, when you look at great speeches, the, they are the simple sentences that, yes. that hang around for eternity. That's it. And that sentence is, although you feel the raid, don't be consumed by it. it that is a, one of those sentences. That, this will be known as the don't be consumed by rage It's speech. a keeper. Yeah. And it, and it, but because he's there and because of all the things we've already mentioned, yeah. the Israelis, you could see, didn't feel hectored yes. or told off. Yeah. They felt, right, this guy gets it. He's empathizing, but he's making a point about not giving into rage. Now, I don't know whether Netanyahu and, uh, you know, the Israeli Defense Force will listen. It's mm. it's very early to say. I hope they will. Isn't it, isn't it in, a, in, a, in a small sense, um, they've already listened to a degree in yes. the sense that they, that, you know, we were all expecting. For, last time we did this podcast on the Thursday last week, by we thought time. by the weekend yeah. the, th that Gaza would be in This absolute... diplomacy round yeah. is having a very... Uh, constructive effect because it's it's delayed that moment yeah because I, they can't do it while because they there. can't do it yeah, while yeah. so that all of that yeah then also there's a practical thing which is there needed to there was a log jam emerging over the whole question of humanitarian aid and specifically the rafa crossing between With Gaza egypt, and yeah. egypt and biden broke it in private and got the egyptians and you know the israelis at least yeah we'll see what hamas do to get, get the the trucks starting to roll. And I say starting to roll because, you know, as I wrote in the New European this week, we need the Rafa crossing open throughout this conflict yeah. as a bare minimum. Yeah. And I don't know with any confidence that it will be, but at least the prospect that it will be intermittently open is now achieved. And that's a big win. He was only there for about seven hours. No, and so that you, you sent me a WhatsApp and you said, this is pure statesmanship. And that's exactly what it was. You know, it was a statesman at work. And, and the weird thing and the sad thing is that we've forgotten that. Yeah. Well, I mean, also, well, it's almost, um, I'm sorry to say, but since probably since Blair, actually, even even Ka you might have a different view. I'm not even sure Cameron. No, I don't. I think was, was I think since Blair enough. is the right. Since Blair, we, the, Britain just hasn't had the uh, no, and, the, the chutzpah, the power to make that kind of difference. and 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 look at Trump. Yeah. Um, Trump has been. I mean, the Republicans first of all can't even elect a speaker. So there's money meant to be going through Congress at the moment for this, which is being snarled up by yeah. their incompetence. Yeah. And Trump has, even by his own standards, disgraced himself yeah. by having a go at Netanyahu. For, I mean, Netanyahu rang Biden to congratulate him about the 2020 election. So Trump has a beef with him. <laughs> right. That's the this level. Is how history turns. That's the level on which that man works, you know. Yeah. And he said that Hezbollah are very smart. Yeah. And suddenly you realise that, you know, Biden is too old to be president. There's no <laughs> question. But by God. He was presidential this week. Yeah, he was, yeah. Um, and I just hope that it, you know, the, the the good things that he's managed to achieve this week, the the credit in the bank yeah. continues. And I hope that, you know, I, I don't know how often Biden will be able to go back to Israel, but I hope that when Blinken, the, Anthony Blinken, the US Secretary of State, or Lloyd Austin, the US Defence Secretary, goes back, or indeed other Western diplomats, that it continues to globalise the thing. Yeah. Because yeah. what... The disaster in all of this is Israel feeling isolated. Yeah. You know, uh, this this was good, this, um, yeah. or as good as it's going to get anyway. Yeah. And the more of it we can have, the more sense of we'll help you, but think before you do yeah. the following. Yeah, no, that, that sentiment. I mean, I was reminded of, you know, it was very paternalistic in a way, wasn't it? It was like a father talking to yes. a... To a a, a grieving son almost you know saying you know i've been there and i understand what's happening but please try and just take a step back for a moment you know but equally as you say it's the own it's a, you can only make that kind of speech if you can do something 
beyond that to help in, yes. in hard terms. If you can sell, send carrier groups, you know, we where's our bloody aircraft carrier, by the way, these days? Is it at sea anymore? No, I mean, we have sent some um, Royal Navy and, and yeah. Marine presence. But I mean... But I mean, we are so diminished as a kind of It's a, shi- it's a, it's a it's, sideshow it, it either, either, yeah. either way. I mean, and it I has th- been for decades, if the truth told. Again, we always on this podcast like to step back. And I think that, you know, this is a huge difference between the Biden of August 2021 retreating from Afghanistan. Yeah, it's there's a there's a kind of sad recognition in underpinning all this that yeah. actually America is not in a position yet to withdraw from yeah. the world. Um, no one, I think, wants it to be the global policeman, yeah. but equally, no one wants it to retreat behind the MAGA Trump stockade either. No. Um, and he's giving a speech. We this is we're recording this before it to to the nation from the Oval Office um, on Thursday evening about you know, big plans for the Middle East and for Ukraine. So there's this bizarre sense that um, actually after the long period of Obama trying to withdraw from the forever wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and and then Trump saying America first with a sort of MAGA version of that and Biden saying, yep, we're leaving Afghanistan for, for keeps over to the Taliban. We've done our best. That somehow... You know, we're we're getting back in by by stages to the necessary supranationalism of yeah. the modern world. Yeah, and it can't be any other way. Talking of supranationalism, Egypt is going to play a big role it's in this. So important. I don't. I mean, Egypt controlled Gaza up until nineteen, whenever it was, when the Israelis effectively kicked them out. Um, Sixty-seven. Sixty-seven. Did you have you seen the Mohammed Salah video? Yeah, I mean, you know, we talk about statesmanship. Okay, here's an extraordinary piece of statesmanship from another, you know, from exactly the opposite end of. Yeah, and I actually wonder whether, in terms of influence and relevance, you know, Mo Salah's probably packing more punch with a lot of yeah. Egyptians and Palestinians and and people in the Arab world than than any politician. And if people haven't seen it, it's, I think it's been viewed about 200 million times now in no, 12 hours. It, I mean, it's phenomenal. And he, and I've never seen anything like it from a sports person, really. Uh, and it's it's a very darkly framed video with Mo Salah saying, there's just been too much pain. You know, can, can we all basically calm down, please, and just take a step back? And I think, you know, it's very consequential. And it probably is, you know... An example of somebody saying something human, which seems utterly absent <coughs> with with a lot of the commentators, especially, I don't know what it's like in the States, but especially here, the argument seems to have devolved completely into, you know, whether you're uh, dogmatically pro-Palestinian or dogmatically pro-Israeli and, 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 and what's in the middle, i.e. The, the common shared humanity of it seems to be getting lost in the debate. There are some people who should know better. Yes. Who, are, who are just shit stirring. Well, uh, I, you know. I mean, I noticed Jeremy Corbyn, certainly at the time of, of recording, Jeremy Corbyn's uh, tweet saying, or X or post or whatever you want to call it now, saying it was definitely Israel that bombed yeah, the hospital. Yeah, yeah. Has 11 million views and is still up. Yeah, a disgrace. And, and it, it is a disgrace. And it's also, you know, you have to go back to October the 7th. What happened on October the 7th was... Um, certainly in modern times, you know, an unprecedented pogrom. No nation on earth would not take action in response yeah, to it. Yeah, of course. The question is what action? Yeah. And the more that Israel feels the warm hug of candid friends from other mm. countries, the better. The less suffering there will be. The more chance there is of the very... I would go no further than the very beginnings of dialogue... You know, this is going to be a long haul. Countries and, and areas and regions don't come back from this kind of um, trauma. You know, the number of people I've seen on Newsnight and other programs talking airily about a two-state solution. Well, do you think? I mean, yeah, yeah great. But, you know, to say that that's on the table at the moment is like saying that in 1941, a... Um, a wonderfully social democratic uh, Germany was just around the corner. Yeah, no, it, it's it's silliness. It's not talking topically, and I think that 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 what has happened this week and why Biden's intervention was so important was that 
it enabled or it should enable people to get a measure of what lies ahead um brace themselves for it but not give up all hope yeah that there are ways of keeping this from turning into you know even more of a bloodbath than it already is it is already a bloodbath yeah. um or, and indeed escalating beyond um what gaza and 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 the sort of immediate precincts in israel yeah which is a clear and present danger i think the the response has to be absolutely surgical they do have to eradicate hamas there's no question about that but you can't do that by absolutely destroying an entire no and it's very nation, difficult yeah. because it is as we know one of the most densely populated areas yeah, yeah. in the whole world yeah. we also know that hamas practices what um uh, there's a great book called The Uti Utility of Force by General Sir Rupert Smith that came out in 2005, I think. And it's he argues in that that the war of the wars of the future will be uh, wars amongst the people, he calls them. Right. And what he's, his point is that forces like Hamas don't come out onto the battlefield or if they do, it's only for a brief incursion like the one that happened on October the 7th, they they hide themselves amongst mm. civilians. They're, 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 they live in tunnels. They're, um, they don't go around in tanks. They they mm. use what, what are called technicals, civilian vehicles that are modified for... So they're not wearing badges. They're not wearing badges. Saying, I'm the guy to shoot. And also, they're, they're, you know, they're, they, they are very adept because there's about 10,000 full-time Hamas fighters Western intelligence thinks, but um, they can mobilize forty to fifty thousand people yeah. very quickly. Yeah. And after the bombardment of the last uh, few days, that that number is probably going to yeah. get bigger. And there was so, a good piece in the Spectator actually about yes. on the day where the, the 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 thesis being that when the Hamas, the actual Hamas operatives launched the pogrom, the lots and lots of other disaffected Palestinian kids effectively yes. thought right let's go you know and joined in so it became magnified in that sense so there's so there's it's not black and white there's a no. fringe there's a there's a hinterland of people who you know are angry and hate the israelis but they're not hamas as well so you've got to have a kind of plan for what after hamas you know how do you if you just eradicate hamas and then say okay right on you go the, the the conditions have to change as well, you know, or, or a new Hamas will just spring up. Yes, you know? I mean, this is why I'm, I'm so unimpressed by Guterres because, and the UN, because what we need now from the UN um, is planning for a some sort of coalition of the willing-led um, transitional authority. Like Bosnia. Gaza, like Bosnia, yeah. you know, yeah, yeah. and we're not there yet and it won't, yeah. won't be there for a while. But... I don't think the Palestinian Authority, Mahmoud Abbas, is up to it. Indeed, there's a, the West Bank is on the verge of just becoming totally disorderly. There are lots of young Palestinians mm. who are furious with um, Mahmoud Abbas and the PA for not being radical enough. Yeah. Um, so the idea that was broached a little bit in the first days of, oh, well, the Palestinian Authority could just take over, I don't think so. And I think that, in fact though this is so counter to orthodoxy nowadays because it has the whiff of nation building which i don't i'm not advocating but i do think there will have to be some sort of interim authority in yeah. in in gaza simply to you know get the infrastructure working again to get the medical Israelis supplies probably in. wouldn't in in their current setup wouldn't tolerate that i don't well imagine that's what why and now again we're at the bone which is that's why it's so important that Biden and the real players yeah. are going out now to get themselves some credit in the bank because the end game of this, when it finally arises, the sooner the better one hopes, um, will be very difficult. And you're right, you know, the, the last thing they'll want is a sort of the Israelis is a kind of Paddy Ashdown figure. Exactly. You know, yeah. but but it, I think it will need something like that. But I like think that. that's what it does need. Yes. Yeah, it really does. Okay, well, listen. Thank you, folks. I uh, hope you enjoyed that conversation so far. We've got a fantastic guest coming up after the break, and we'll be talking about Germany's position in all of this and, and how the EU are looking at Israel. And we're talking to a woman who knows exactly the inside track on she that. She certainly so does. Stay tuned. So this week, I have a very special offer for you. Um, if you choose to subscribe to The New European and get much more of what you hear on this podcast in print or online. 
We have free signed copies of James O'Brien's brilliant new hardback book, how They Broke Britain. And I've read it. Have you read it, Matt? No, I'm looking forward to it. I'm going to send you the PDF. Please. An advance from the publisher. It's absolutely brilliant. You'd expect nothing less from no, he's great. James O'Brien. He's fantastic. But it is absolutely uh, devastating and insightful. And you read it and you are entertained and absolutely no, livid he, in he, equal measure. He's one of a kind. He really, he really is. is. So James O'Brien uh, has, is signing hundreds and hundreds of copies of new books, waiting for lovely new subscribers to The New European. And you can... Get all we do online for just one pound a week. Or if like me and like the other Matt, you prefer to get your newspaper delivered to your door every week, you can have that for just another pound a week. The heft, the heft of the newspaper dropping on your door, Matt. Think of the joy it brings every single week. And you'll be doing something positive about the state of the media in this country, though I say so myself. So anyway, go to the neweuropean.co.uk forward slash two mats. That's the number two. M A T T S, the new European.co.uk forward slash two mats, and subscribe to the new European from just one pound a week and get a free copy of James O'Brien's brilliant new book signed by the author himself. Welcome back. Um, I'm delighted to say we're joined now by Tanit Koch, who is a uh, new European columnist. She writes the fabulously entertaining German splaining column every week, which gives great insight into how Germany works, and, and uh, it is really, really uh, very, very good. And Tanit is also a former editor of Built, which is the uh, it's the biggest newspaper in, in Europe, actually. Uh, and so, Tanit, you're joining us from Frankfurt, from the Frankfurt Book Fair. Thank you for coming on. Thank you for having me. You're most welcome. We, we thought it'd be great to learn from a German about what the uh, European, but also specifically the German outlook on what's going on in Israel and Palestine is right now. What's the, what is the mood in Germany? What, what is Germany thinking about this? Well, it's twofold. First of all, I think everyone, like any, any person with empathy and uh, a bit of sort of humanity left um, within themselves, uh, were just uh, appalled and sickened by what we all saw on, on 7th of October. So the the shock that this is happening, that terror is being live streamed uh, into everybody's smartphone, basically. I think we all share that. Uh, the sort of German uniqueness is, is, of course, that our country will always be very closely linked to the state of Israel, which was founded um, shortly, also basically actually around the time that the Republic of Germany was founded. And so a lot of Germans feel, and we've, we've all, who have been taught our history in school feel uh, a responsibility for the never again. That said, um, there is a lot of never again at um, panels and and receptions and and official statements. And then when it comes to implementing never again, what we see at the moment is that we have um, large protests, not not as large maybe as in London, but but still we've, we've had hundreds of people on the streets. Um, sometimes clashing with the police, violent uh, demonstrations, so-called peace in the Middle East or free Palestine demonstrations, but um, they all turned out to be anti-Semitic protests in the end. Uh, we saw uh, a mob shouting, Scheiß Juden, I don't think I need to translate that, in front of a synagogue in the region in, in Gelsenkirchen. Um, we've had people hand out sweets, uh, to celebrate uh, the atrocities committed by by Hamas, and this is as well Palestinian or Arab migrants, second generation, third generation, first generation. We can't really tell, but it's also wide parts of the uh, of the radical left or even moderate left that uh, find it easier to be sort of pro-Palestine instead of um, standing close to Israel in that time. So, um, Tani, one of the first big world leaders to go uh, to Tel Aviv was um, the the German Chancellor Olaf Scholz. And it was clear that Benjamin Netanyahu was very grateful for his presence. Um, how has Scholz's visit gone down in Germany? Well, because so on his way back, um, they had uh, a bomb threat or sort of an air raid alert that actually sort of then dominated the news because it was a plane full of reporters and they all had to leave the plane in a rush and and lie flat on the ground and uh, I think it was important for for Schultz to, to have been there and to have been there that early. Personally I would have liked to see him go together with Emmanuel Macron to, to show sort of a, a, a Frank, yes. Franco-German 
joint approach uh, in those times. Uh, there was a German who's actually there before uh, Olaf Scholz. Uh, Olaf Scholz, uh, Ursula. exactly <laughs> Ursula von der Leyen, and and uh, I think she uh, she did a great job by being there so early. Uh, a lot of her European colleagues from the European Council. She's of course Commission President, but there's also President of the Council, Charles Michel, former Belgian uh, Prime Minister. They don't particularly like each other, and sort of the amount of hostilities within Brussels, the, the offices are basically across the street, uh, unheard of or unseen of before, and there have been hostilities early on. They're obviously not as as brutal. They are still quite significant because one side, the council side, is, is accusing von der Leyen of basically overstepping her authority, whereas the commission side is saying she's doing exactly what, what should be done. Um, but we, we can already see that sort of Team Europe, as it's officially calling itself, is showing very little team spirit at the moment. It's interesting, and 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 I, ga- I gather that she's also been at odds, not for the first time, with Josep Borrell, the um, the foreign policy chief. Yes. Uh, so there's there's, it looks to me as if it was absolutely the right call to go. However, as you say, there's quite a lot of um, internal division over it. There is, and we do see sort of national reflexes coming into the game here because um, Germany, you've mentioned Scholz, uh, he again has stressed was Angela Merkel has uh, what Angela Merkel has stressed before him and basically every single German chancellor that the security and the right uh, of, of Israel to exist is uh, a German, we call it Deutsche Staatsraison, Raison d'État. That's basically a matter of highest importance for any action of the German state. It's it's not sort of a foreign policy issue. It is a, a German state affair to to secure the uh, the right of existence uh, of, of Israel. So that will always be a, a guiding principle of any German statesman. Um, I hope, <laughs> but it does look like it at, at the moment. We have other other states in Europe. We have uh, Belgium. France, uh, Ireland, um, Spain, Portugal, who traditionally have a more Palestinian leaning well, history and, and policy. So I think Michael Higgins, the president of the Republic of Ireland, said that the, the German, meaning Ursula von der Leyen, wasn't speaking for, for Ireland when she not just said that uh, Israel had, had the right to self-defense. I think that's one thing all, all European states do agree on at the moment. But she uh, did not stress and did not lecture Benjamin Netanyahu on his, um, well, the, basically the way how to um, go forward in that self-defense. Um, I think she made clear when talking to him uh, bilaterally, personally, uh, sources say that the EU is expecting restraint within um, within the right of self-defense, within the, the international law. But she didn't publicly lecture him, whereas José Borrell and Charles Michel, who do that sort of social media loud speaking politics game, made it quite clear and were very vociferous about um, their thoughts of, of Israel expecting or sort of sealing off Gaza, um, calling calling people to, to, to go move, evacuate to the south of Gaza, questioning whether this is within international law. Um, and there you actually do see this. I've actually been quite um, uh, impressed by von der Leyen's approach because I think it shows that she sees the bigger picture. This is not about land. This is not about whether you like orthodox Jewish settlers or whether you think that Abbas should have an election, maybe <laughs> sometime within the next 10 years, and whether the Palestinians should get their act <laughs> together and stop the corruption and actually help their own people. This is about geopolitics. This is about Iran. This is about Russia. This is about China. This is about sort of our interests and not sort of are we more solidaric with one side or with the other side. And I think von der Leyen has, has very much understood that this on the same time when the European Council had their, their virtual remote meeting. Viktor Orban, the Hungarian prime minister, was um, sort of connected to that meeting uh, from from China. Um, and we saw pictures of him shaking hands with Vladimir Putin, whom he'd met in China, because he really does not give or care a lot, let's 
put it politely, about what, what Brussels is saying when there are Hungarian interests or his personal interests that say that he should keep dealing with Russia the way he's he's always dealt with Russia, which is a definitely more friendly way. So I think not sort of losing sight of the bigger picture, um, which is there and which is which is dominant and where the EU doesn't really figure at the moment as a geopolitical player. I think it's very much on, on Ursula von der Leyen's agenda, but then as a uh, some other EU, especially council representatives say, it's actually not within her competency, within her authority to do foreign policy. So we still have the problem, is there actually a EU foreign policy? And if there is, it's certainly not a united one. Talking about the, the bigger picture, is there any concern in, the, in, in Germany about what now happens in terms of the agenda uh, in Ukraine? Because Ukraine has dropped off the, the news agenda for sure. But also I start to wonder whether it's going to drop off government's agendas as well as this becomes the dominant problem in geopolitics. Well, we've already heard Ursula von der Leyen, other EU leaders, also German leaders, the foreign, the foreign secretary, the chancellor, stress that Vladimir Putin and that Hamas and Iran is not going to, or that this new conflict is not going to, to deflect from the effort. Uh, we, we have to sort of keep on uh, doing or keeping up in uh, in Ukraine. The thing is, um, with elections coming up, uh, with the European elections coming up, with elections in, in, in two German, especially Eastern states coming up next year, um, public opinion, let's say solidarity for Ukraine may have peaked within Germany. And this new conflict certainly is is not helping the Ukrainian cause. On the other hand, um, again, it's not about sort of charity. Do we do we like Zelensky? Do we think we should help Ukrainians? Again, this is about sort of our our way of life, our liberties being defended somewhere else. Let it be in Israel. Let it be in the Ukraine. And I think on, on state level, people have understood we, we do have a problem in Germany at the moment with sort of public opinion, quite fearful of sort of a renewal of uh, Islamist terrorism. Migration has already been the influx of, of, of refugees, which is actually uh, on a larger scale than it was 2015, if you take Ukrainian refugees um, and other asylum seekers into uh, into the picture. So European migration policy, German migration policy, German, German asylum policy is just the elephant in the room and it hasn't been solved for for decades and the pressure now is is basically bigger than it was ever before just just one example the the, the terrorist who killed those two swedish football fans in in brussels um i just read that he he had asylum applications since i think 2011 in four different european countries in sweden and norway definitely um, belgium as well so four countries were, which were all denied um, and still, we're sort of 2023. Um, the guy's been sort of in, in Europe seeking asylum, not being granted asylum. In the end, killing two two Swedish citizens in Brussels. This is a very gruesome example or metaphor, actually, for what what European migration and asylum policy looks like at the moment. It's interesting, isn't it? Because you know we've we've seen the you mentioned the demonstrations and they've been going on all over the world. Um, but also in, in Illinois on Saturday, a six-year-old Muslim boy was stabbed yes. to death. Um, there's a sense, and we were just talking about this, Tana, you know, that there's a sense that this really is a global moment. It's a moment of profound, complex interconnectedness. And I think that that hasn't been sufficiently uh, reflected in the UK media, where there's a, there's a sort of reduction to it as if it's really just a sort of Super Bowl of Palestinians versus Israelis where people sit on the side and comment on, you know, either either team, as it were. Uh, what has Is there a greater sense in, in Germany, do you think, of, of how international this is? I'm afraid not. Um, but as you, you mentioned, mm. the, um, the that shocking crime in Illinois, I was... Um, I, I must say that the, the propaganda and sort of the ignorance is 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 simply there and it won't go away. You 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 see what's been happening with a with a hospital, and the explosion at that hospital. How easy it was. Um, you mentioned UK media. We have very sort of self proclaimed, but but seriously, sort of quality quality media in Germany that immediately jumped on the news that Israel had it was, was strike. 
uh, against against the hospital and bombed uh, a hospital in Gaza without waiting until sort of all the facts were checked. As did the BBC. Hmm. Yeah, and with the BBC, I heard that there, there apparently is an issue of calling Hamas yeah. terrorists, which I, I, from a German perspective, that is just surreal. I mean, we have mm. journalists and also public broadcasters and other broadcasters who sort of shift between terrorists and fighters and militants and, and all of that. But to have an official policy of, yeah. of not taking, of sort of not calling a terrorist a terrorist is very weird from, from my perspective. Mm. They've rode back ever so slightly, the BBC, which is they're now often referring to Hamas in bulletins and magazine programmes as an organisation which is classified as terrorist by many governments, which is quite <laughs> long-winded and <laughs> slightly catchy, very catchy. Yeah. yeah, it's very catchy. It grabs you, doesn't it? <laughs> well, listen, I want to say thank you yes, so thank much you, for Chana. taking time out of your really, really book good. fair day to come and speak to us. That's been illuminating. Um, as always. Thank you, Tanit. And you can read Tanit every single week in the brilliant New European. It's a must read. Brilliant German splaining, which is worth the cover price alone, Certainly I can is. promise you. We don't pay her enough. She knows that. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Tanit. Cheers. Tanit, thank you. Thank you so much thanks for having for me. Take us. care. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks again to Tanit, uh, and that's it for this uh, this show this week. Thank you so much. Get your questions into us and any feedback. Uh, the email is two mats. That's the number two m a t t s at t n e publishing dot co dot uk. And our first question and answer episode woo, comes on Sunday. Big news. So that's two episodes a week. You lucky people. Two and formats. Don't forget, yeah, the formats. <laughs> Don't forget our new special deal, which is a free signed copy of James O'Brien's brilliant new book, How They Broke Britain, when you subscribe to The New European from just £1 a week. And so you just go to theneweuropean.co.uk forward slash two mats. That's the number two M-A-T-T-S uh, to claim that amazing offer while stocks last. And there is a link in the show notes. Thank you as ever to the third Matt, our producer, Matt Hill at Rethink Audio. And until next week. It's goodbye from me. And it's goodbye from him. Goodbye. Goodbye.